My name is Junan Kandwanaho and I'm the MD at Jonaki Holdings Limited. And at Jonaki Holdings Limited, we offer loans, we give credit efficiently and at affordable rates. So if you need a loan, if you need money, just come to us. We are located in Tinda, Kisachi Mall, uh, third floor of suit number 39. So we look forward to serving you. Well, so we meet every Friday to talk about business. You could be running a business, you could be anticipating to start a business, or you could have a dream at a certain point to start a business, you could have started it yesterday even. <laughs> You're also welcome on board. Because either way, we come here to sharpen each other, because iron sharpens iron. And we are here to guide each other on how we can thrive in business. However, among us, the many businesses, there are several niches or what you'd call a particular industry that you lie in. For example, Janaki Holdings Limited lies in the finance industry. So you could be lying in maybe catering or services industry, you could be lying in telecoms, you could be lying in engineering. So I purposely uh, focus this talk to the niche of finance lending money and i've been doing so for uh, for uh, the last three weeks i've been focusing on money lending because we lend money and i've been taking you through the process that we go through to save the bad clients from the good clients and to make sure by god's grace that a client pay back that in the event that the clients fail to pay back then you have a leeway or you have a fallback position that you can use to recover the money that you put in because you're not running a charity organization, isn't it? <laughs> you're not running an NGO. Meaning that if the clients come for money, they definitely are meant to pay back. If the clients come for loans, they definitely have to pay back. So you have to make your process a bit uh, fraud proof in quotes because you might not be 100 percent fraud proof but you'll uh, block a few leakages and some of us have learned from experience you guys experience is the best teacher but it is the worst teacher learning from experience is very expensive i personally learned from experience in some of the instances and it has not been a very good experience and to some of you guys who are running similar business you might not learn or you might not implement all the things that I've been telling you until you learn from experience the only unfortunate bit is that your learning from experience might, might cost your whole business let me give you an example if you if you have a money lending business of let's say worth 50 million or you started lending money with 30 million and a client comes for 20 million or 25 million and you do not you've not sealed the leakages that could cause the client to not only run away with your money but also you do not have any backup position through which you can use to recover your money so what's the likelihood the likelihood is such that if the client is a bad client you might run out of business. Not you might, you will run out of business. I'm being honest with you. So in that instance, the experience that you've used to learn has costed your whole business. So you have to start newly from zero to bring up or save that capital. I learned that very thing. If you've read the book called The Richest Man in Babylon, if you're to learn from experience, you might close shop. And this might apply to all categories of businesses. So you don't have to learn from, 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 from experience because it might cost you a whole business. That's why you have to learn from such talks. That's why you have to learn uh, from uh, these business interactions that I even usually posted on YouTube. So check out our YouTube channel 
Jonan Kandwa Naho and you can look at the whole process that you go through to seal those leakages that can help you thrive in business, particularly in money lending. And if you had a chance and you're still running by God's grace, now is the time that you acquaint yourself with the key things, with the key process steps that you have to look at before you give a client money so that in the event that the client fails to pay, then you can recover your money. So I've done a whole series of the steps that you go through, right up from loan application to loan assessment. Now I'm going to talk about loan approval. Then in our next session, I'll talk about loan collection, then the after sales service. And that will seal or will mark the end of our series on money lending steps. So today we are going to talk about loan approval. So the, the following things are meant to be done. I'm assuming that you watched the part one of the series which is loan application. You've watched part two of the series which is loan assessment. Now we are on loan approval. So, before you, you approve a loan, there are several things you have to look at. First, is that you have to have, you could be a small player, but you have to have more than one person committee, called a loans committee. The essence of the committee is such that you as one person might not be able to look at the leakages that could be existent and until you identify those leakages, you cannot bridge them. Until you identify those leakages, you cannot close them. So meaning that if the leakages are still there, the business will leak. I'll give an example. If I have a cup and it has a leakage somewhere, I'll put milk, but before I sip three times, if that cup has a hole, which in this case is a leakage, it will definitely run out the milk. So by the time I take a third sip, I might not find milk in the cup. So until you seal the leakages that you have in your steps that you go through to see if the clients still give them money, the leakages might cost you money. And in this instance, the clients that come on board, if you do not uh, assess them well to the point of approval you might lose your money so the key thing you have to look at is the loan committee more than one person even if you're starting you need a second eye you need a second view that in instance of missing out a particular thing that we covered in the loan assessment someone else will look at it and that's why I advise that a loan committee should have more than one person. So that any leakage that will have passed through the assessment can actually be looked at. Secondly, there has to be steps. There has to be a person who enters the data in the system if you have a system. And in case you don't have a system, before you approve the loan, There has to be someone who has to initiate the approval and there has to be someone who has to approve. It's not the thing of, you know, someone coming for money and you approve right there and then. So the approval process, you, if you're the owner or the MD of the business, should be the last person to look at the loan application formed by the client. You should be the last person. Meaning that there should be some other eyes that should have looked at the different requirements that have to be met before the loan is approved. 
the approval process has to be done in a way that the money is wired to the account of the client who has applied for a loan. Now, I shared the experience. Some clients will come to you and they tell you, you know what, Jonan, I am very, very uh, in a dire need of money, so you had better approve the money. I need cash, because even the bank process is a long story. Such clients will come up. Clients will come and put in a lot of pressure that you might actually end up making mistakes. And the, the loan approval process, or the last step, which is the approval process, is a very important process that you have to look at. That even amid this pressure, you have to make sure that the client that the, the client receives money through his or her bank account. You don't give cash. You know why? Because in the event that the client fails to pay, you need to produce evidence in the courts of the law. You need to produce evidence at the police to show that actually the money reached the client. We had an instance when we gave a client money and he said, you know what? I didn't receive the money. And you can imagine if you gave the client hard cash, how do you prove that the person received the money? You do not have any trail. If you go to the hospital for treatment and you're employed, you know, you call your boss, today I'm not able to come to work, I am sick. What is the evidence that you give that actually you are sick? Because some of the institutions require that. Most of the institutions require that evidence. It is a medical form. It is the prescription from the doctor. And so is the case in lending money. Where is the evidence that actually you gave this person money? It is a bank trail. Because if worse comes to us, you have to go to the, to the banks, get the statement, you on your side of the company, confirming that the money left your, your account, and then go on the client side and confirm that actually the person received money. Now, you wouldn't want to, to go through such a process, but if the transaction so requires you to go through, so you go through. Because you even need to get, to get court order. Because by the time the client fails to pay and adamantly refuses to pay, things have gotten out of hand. So even getting the statement, it's not the client who gives you the statement from their bank account. You have to get court order. You have to get court, court order straight to the bank by the, the CID or the police and get the statement of the client. But then have a proverb that the person you give money while you're seated, sometimes you collect it while standing. So it won't be rosy. It won't be rosy. And that's why you should make time to acquaint yourself with this information. That's why you have to make time to, to, to get a mentor. That's why you have to make time to learn these things. Or else you will not celebrate your first, even second anniversary. Because fraudsters are for real. Crooks are for real. So you have to acquaint yourself with this knowledge and information so that you can shield yourself from such frauds, fraudsters and such anomalies. So you have to make sure you have the trail of the transaction. You do not give hard cash, but rather you wire money to the client who has applied for the money. And I emphasize that you wire the money to the client himself. Now there are some instances when a client says, you know what, I don't have a bank account, so could you please wire that money through someone else, his account? Now ideally, if you do not have, if you're not strict, you'll go by that. But when you get to court, when things have gotten out of hand, when that person has failed to pay, he'll definitely say that, no, you didn't wire money to me. You wired the money to someone else, so I, I'm not recipient, I'm not recipient of the loan. So you need to prove beyond reasonable doubt that this client is related to this person or knows this person, which is still a long story or which you might even fail to prove that this person is related to the person that he told you to wire the money to. So it is ideal that it, if, if it's a phone and you're wiring the money to the client's phone, that phone is registered in that client's names. And how do you prove the names? 
Because that client will bring a phone and say, I'm called John and Kandwa now. So you need to prove that the client is John and Kandwa now. National ID. National ID. Now it so happens that the client might actually forge the national ID. So you need to double check the national ID and its authenticity. I told you that's why you have to watch the loan assessment step that I shared last Friday. So all these trails, you have to make sure that there is some bit of seal in the possible leakages. Because, mind you, this person is not here to play around with you. This person is serious. He seriously planned, or she seriously planned, to come and defraud you. He didn't come out of blue. This guy sat down and planned. That's why someone can even sit down and forge national ID, forge the bank account, open those names, for, for the sake of defrauding you. For the sake of defrauding you. They can even register a particular mobile phone in those names in which the ID falls. So before you approve the loan, make sure you wire the money to the right client, right names, right applicant, and you have to make sure that they are the legitimate owners of those names and identities that they put before you. So in the event that they fail to pay, you can actually track them to the last bit. That's how important it is. That's how important it is. Secondly, you have to make sure that before you wire the money, all the nativities that have to be done before are done. If it is a car, it has to be caveated. Now, there are some fraudsters that come and bring you car logbooks. You know, the guy is genuinely the owner of the, of the car. The logbook is in his name. But he has the other person on the other end who is on standby with a TIN number. He already gave them the TIN number, he already gave them the password, and they are ready to transfer the car the moment you wire the money. So meaning that if you wire the money because of the pressure that the client has put on you and the car is not yet caveated, you'll wire the money and behold, the car is transferred to someone else. And then the music starts. <laughs> the music starts. You've already wired the money, the car is no longer in the, in the client's names and then you start fidgeting why because you didn't assess to make sure that the car is already caveated before you wired the money so what would you have done or what should you have done you should have made sure that the caveat is already on the logbook before the money is wired to the client you should have made sure that that is done but you did not and you hear it to wire the money before you confirm that. And that's why the fraudsters make it a point. They make it a point to put you on pressure at the last minute of the approval of wiring the money so that you can fidget to wire the money before the caveat is on the car lock. And before you realize it, the money is gone, the car is gone, and it's starting from zero. Because you cannot lodge a caveat if the car is already transferred from that guy's name. You cannot put it there. So the ideal is that lodge the, the caveat before the money is wired to the client. Make sure the caveat is there before that loan is approved. That's a key thing. Because then you cannot transfer that item, you cannot transfer that car Unless your company releases the, the caveat removal letter authorizing a URA, now Ministry of Transport, to remove that caveat. So meaning that the client is tied up, so he cannot transfer that car without your consent. In that instance, your money is secure and you've held up or you've tapped on the head of the fraudster. So before you approve, you have to make sure that they do, the, 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 the final step that you're meant to do is actually done. 
Now, if you're using another category of collateral, for example, land, I know that's why land takes a little longer steps and takes a little longer period of time. Because you do not, that for us, the car, you can lodge a caveat in a matter of hours. Sometimes you might not be able to lodge a mortgage on the land in hours. Even if you have contacts like how, even if you have connections, it becomes a little tricky to put a mortgage on the land in hours. That's why for land, it takes a bit of days. Why? Because you need to first pay and double check with lands and then there are steps that the lands, the lands office has to go through before they put a mortgage on that land title. So you need to make sure that you have ample time before you wire the money. The mortgage has to be on the land title. Because someone might give you a collateral first that does not belong to them. There are guys who have specialized in manufacturing land titles. So you have to make sure that the guy is the actual owner of the land title. We had a very nice experience in that aspect. Someone has an original land title that cannot even be depreciated by the land office. The land office cannot even confirm whether the land title is fake or it's original. And they tell you, you know what, Jonan? I think this land title is original. And when they double check, they actually realize the land title is fake. But when you're paying for the mortgage, there's an email that is sent to the legitimate owner of the land. So meaning that the owner of the land is notified. So he has a leeway of contacting land office to say that, you know what? The transaction that is happening on this land, I'm not the one who authorized it. In Uganda, they call it Okwekubirindulu. Because you don't want to engage in a transaction that is going to cause you problems. You don't want to give money on land that has a fake land title. Because the consequence of that is you losing the money or battling in courts of law for a long period of time. So that's why it's important that you first make sure that the mortgage is lodged on the land title before you actually give out the money. Now in addition to lodging the mortgage, you need to make sure that the actual signatories, if the person is married and they are, they are giving the collateral of the house, of the home, then the wife has to, has to sign, even the children. It's that important. Because in the event that even if, in the event that the, the, the loan applicant, perhaps if, if it's a husband, applies for a loan and it turns around, the wife might say, I don't know about that, that transaction. And this is our marital home. And in the courts of the law, you cannot take them on. Because she didn't consent. And even if you put a mortgage on that land title, it won't change a thing. You will definitely battle it in courts of law and you might actually lose the case. Why? Because the wife did not consent. He didn't give a consent to that transaction. Now, there are some religions that authorize more than one spouse. Now, that's where the music comes in. Person tells you, you know, I'm in this home alone, I'm single, I'm not married. In the event that a person takes a loan, even mortgage the land title, then the person comes again when you're almost foreclosing on the property because they intentionally did the thing that they did, they got the money to defraud you, when you plan to defraud, I mean to foreclose, the guy brings in a wife. And he's, he confirms he's married. And the court recognizes the person is married. The court recognizes the religion. He has a wife. There are several types of marriages, customary, religious. I mean, there are several categories, civil marriages. Those different types. So what should you do? This is what we call URSB, Uganda Registration Services Bureau. 
that is meant to confirm that actually that person is either married or not. And the moment you have that confirmation in the courts of the law, it should be recognized that at the, at, at, the, at the point of releasing that money, that guy was not married. And it will give you a leeway to foreclose on that property in case the client fails to pay. So you need to make sure that all these leakages are sealed. First, before you release money on the land title, make sure that the mortgage is already there. We had a very nice experience where, because of the pressure of the client, and because then, even the mentor told me, Jonan, do A, B, C, D. But because I'd not learned the hard way, like most of you are going to learn the hard way, God forbid, if you don't take on these things seriously, I paid deaf ear to the advice of my mentor. Because he told me before you wire the money, kindly make sure that the mortgage is on the title. And lo and behold, I didn't make sure that the mortgage was on the title. I wired the money, a chunk of money, not even small money. I wired money to the client, and when we went to put the mortgage on the land, as I told you, they sent an email to the actual owner of the land. So when the email from here A reached the, the owner of the land, the owner of the land, because sometimes you cannot even uh, prove that the owner of the land didn't connive with the, with the client. Some of the owners of the land connive with the clients to come and apply for a loan and use that leakage to defraud you of your money. So as soon as we're going to put the mortgage, the, the, client, the actual owner of the land, because he got a notification of the email, instructed the lawyer to go to Wakiso to stop the transaction, putting a mortgage on the land. And that's when the music started. And that's when we came to realize that the guy defrauded us. That's when we came to realize that the guy had forged the, the national ID. He had even uh, forged the land title. And usually, mind you, these guys who come with the titles are applying for chunks of monies. This client had applied for 70 million. Now you can imagine if your only sole capital is 70 million, you're out of business. Right away, you're out of business. Or you can imagine if you got a loan somewhere to come and lend out here. You can imagine, you can lose your properties. <laughs> you might even run mad. So fast forward, this lawyer goes there and we cannot put a mortgage on this land title. Following up with the, with, the, with the fraudster, the guy had more than five cases at CPS. He had called more than five guys. Same thing. He was under warrants of arrest. So where did you start from? We came to realize the guy had defrauded us. Some of these fraudsters even connived with the owners of the land. He says, let me check everything. When time comes, for a, for a transaction, I'll give you a cut. If he gets a loan of 50 million, he gives him like 25. He, he doesn't have anything to lose because he didn't work for the man. And the owner of the land is on standby that the moment you go there to lodge a mortgage, he will stop you because he's a legitimate owner of the land. Now, I know some of these videos are going to land in the hands of the, of the fraudsters. And it's going to be a leeway for them to land. As I always said, it is upon us as lenders, as money lenders, as financial institutions, it's upon us to, cre to, to clean out, to clean out this industry. Because even on the side of the, of the institutions, of the financial institutions, there are those who are not doing legitimate business. So it's our responsibility to make sure that we clean up the business, both on the side of the institutions and on the side of the clients. It is our responsibility. And that's why I make my time to come and share with you every Friday of the week that you see those leakages, you see those gaps. And on the side of the clients, if you're there and you're fraudster, time is catching up with you. Time is going to come when our industry is clean. 
And that's why I labor. I purposely labor. Commit my time and data to come and share with you the experiences so that we deal with these fraud stats both on the end of the clients but also on the end of the financial institutions. Because based on the stories as well, there are some financial institutions that defraud clients. Someone gives you his, his or her collateral and by the time they come to pay up, you know where to be seen. You've changed office. Some of the clients sign transfer forms and you've before the client, the time comes for him to pay the interest on the loan, you've transferred the land title to your names. Terrible. So we have to see, if we have to filter through this industry. We have to make it clean. We have to clean it up. It is our responsibility. So I see my time is fast spent. You have opportunities for a mastermind that I run. It is starting uh, early February. You'll come to know. It's, I charge it. Or you have the leeway to come and get mentored. I mentor at a fee still, so that we can move this business together and swiftly. Apart from that, you can check out my YouTube channel. Click that like button. Click that bell uh, button. When the video is posted, you'll get a notification. And subscribe to that channel, Junan Kanduanoho. I'll be glad to see you at the top. God bless you. God shine his face upon you. God bless the works of your hands. And may you grow, grow, and grow to employ thousands and thousands of people and help as many businesses as you can and support as many people who need money as possible so that we can grow this country, so that we can grow this economy, so that we can grow this world. God bless you. Have a great Friday. And the rest of the weekend, enjoy and blessings. Thank you, guys. I love you.